Welcome to the Creative Strings Podcast. This is episode 41 with David Cutler. We're exploring his new project, Supernova, a wild genre hopping reimagination of Suzuki Book One that injects creativity and fun into string music education. Hello, and welcome to the Creative Strings Podcast. I'm Christian Howes, violinist, educator, and music business entrepreneur. I hope these interviews will inspire you to be creative in your life, in your art, in your business, in every way. So without further ado, let's get to it. Hey there, I'm really excited to share this episode with you today with my special guest, David Cutler. A couple things you might know about me or not know about me (laughs) is that I'm a Suzuki-trained violinist. Uh, I'm also a Suzuki dad twice. Um, (laughs) Two kids gone through Suzuki with. Um, And I'm a big fan of the Suzuki community, the Suzuki method and everything it stands for. I realize that there are a lot of controversial opinions about Suzuki. But this particular project, I think, is super special. I think it's the kind of thing that can really revolutionize and inspire not only the Suzuki teaching community, but any folks out there that are teaching in the classical music world. Uh, And that's what I'm all about. So excited for you to learn more about this. You're going to hear a lot of um, these incredible arrangements that David has created. We're going to play lots of the arrangements for you. And want to make sure that you know that you can learn about his projects, a lot more about it. There's so many facets of it. If you go to tinyurl.com forward slash supernova music. So check that out, bear that in mind. But of course, I want you to listen to this episode. I think you get a lot out of it. I do want to thank our sponsors, Yamaha. Uh, Yamaha has sponsored me for over 20 years, and I truly feel like a member of the family at Yamaha. I value my relationship with all the people at Yamaha. And I also know that the company is a stand for quality. And that's reflected in their instruments, their warranties, and also in their consistent and steadfast support for music educators. Uh, Throughout the music industry, we depend on Yamaha. Creative string players depend on Yamaha. You can get some of their free resources uh, by Googling support ed. Yamaha Support Ed, and you can get their free newsletter and magazine for uh, music educators. I also want to thank our sponsor, Electric Violin Shop. If you haven't heard me say it before, the biggest reason I love Electric Violin Shop as the resource for all things electric strings is because you can simply call them on the phone. Their number's at their website, electricviolinshop.com. Just call them on the phone anytime during business hours, and they will simply answer all your questions. (laughs) What could be better? I get so many questions every week. People asking me about effects pedals, electric violins. When should I use a pickup? When should I use a mic? Da-da-da-da-da, loop pedals, whatever it might be. Just call them. They're an amazing resource. That's Electric Violin Shop. Thanks so much to our sponsors, and now let's get into the episode. David Cutler, thank you so much for being here with me today on the Creative Strings Podcast. I am extremely excited about this project. I've already introduced you. Everybody knows about it, but they've got to be wondering, like, what is it all about? And I feel like the best thing we can do first is just play something for people so they can hear this amazing music. Would you do me the honor of selecting a first tune that we can play for people so they can hear Suzuki Book One completely reimagined? Let's roll. Here is Lightly Row.
so we just listened to Lightly Row. Everybody here is thinking like, wow, I've never heard that version of Lightly Row. Is there anything you could, just briefly, anything you'd say about what, you know, uh, inspired you for that version of, of Lightly Row? The challenge for this collection, there were 17 tunes. And so I wanted to set them in 17 different styles of music. So for each one, I just kind of asked, what inherently does this mean? If I, if I can release it from the original accompaniment, where does it want to go? And for that one, it just, it just felt like boogie to me. That's awesome. That's awesome. And we listened to the version, um, the, I guess you could say the straight melody version by Rebecca Hunter, wonderful Suzuki teacher and also wonderful classical violinist. And, and I know that, you know, part of what makes this project, I think, special, so many things, there's so many things about this project, we're going to cover this, but you had all the pieces recorded by Rebecca playing melody, but in all these really very creative interpretations of the melody, right? right? Which you've referred to as uh, creative performance practice. I wonder if you could just speak briefly to that. You know, in the classical music tradition, which is part of my background, right? I have a classical background and jazz background and a popular music background, all of those things. But in classical music, the paradigm is often what we call authentic performance practice. So the idea is that you get this score from this creative genius, this master composer, and it tells you all the notes and the rhythms and the dynamics and the articulations. And your job is to play it in the right way as sanctioned by that composer and is stylistically correct. And there's great value to doing that. It's helped define a lot of my music making. And, and I think it's a really important process for music making. But creative performance practice has a little different value. It looks at music, even classical music, as if it's a collaboration between two creative geniuses, the composer and the performer. And so the idea is, yes, you, you're, you're given something and it's a starting point, but then your job as a performer is not just to play it, not just to recreate it, but to personalize and to customize. And so when working with Rebecca Hunter on this whole collection, we set some rules. I told her, Rebecca, the notes cannot change. The rhythms may not change. Anything else eh, is fair game. So if you want to add a crescendo, or to change the bowing or the articulation or use a very different color. Maybe you play something pizzicato or up an octave or twice as fast, you know, doubled up like tremolo. Be my guest. See if you can make this in a way that no mistake it with anyone else. And so it's as cool as the accompaniment parts are, but always staying true to these original melodies. It was a really fun, creative process and a way to use even this very, you know, this beginning violin music to demonstrate really advanced concepts. It's great. You know, as a Suzuki uh, kid myself, from the time I was five, I remember my Suzuki teacher, Jenny Christofferson in Columbus, Ohio, she cared about these kinds of things. And I remember, you know, when I look back, I remember once I got the, once I got the notes, once I got the rhythms, she loved to, to bring in these you know these things hey how can we make this really special and a lot of suzuki teachers they'll tell stories about the pieces and then you know now my son he's 10 he's doing suzuki and my oldest child did suzuki and so i've been a suzuki dad twice and i know that the suzuki community is gonna embrace this project supernova uh with with wide open arms i want to move along i want people to hear more music and i want to kind of bring them something that's a shock to the system which i think andantino would would hopefully provide that and so if it's okay with you i'd like if we could play an excerpt of andantino and this is going to be one with me doing the improvised version because you've got 17 versions with rebecca playing the straight melody over your uh reimagined arrangements in 17 different genres but then you also have 17 performances <laughs> tracks of me improvising great chris house <laughs> so on this one i'll just tell everybody i'm not even going to tell people but if you know andantino just listen for the melody and we're going to listen to that real quick now
Okay, so that was on Dantino with, <laughs> sure with, me bringing, with me bringing in the wah pedal. And do you remember what you told me before, you know, we recorded? Because you came to my house in North Carolina and you supervised, you know, a lot of the recordings that I did on these. Do you remember any of the instructions you gave me as the improviser on these, or on, specifically on, on Dantino? Because we got the wah wah, the distortion. I don't remember if you asked for it, if I was like, wait, I'm going to just bring it out. Do you remember? We tried to have a different approach for every piece. And so most of most of them, I think you're playing acoustic violin on most of them. Right. And then you're on electric for a couple of them. And that was, of course, one of those. And remember, Minuet 2, you're actually playing octave Geiger, if that's even a thing, right? This, right. this big, it's like this overgrown baby Huey <laughs> violin that, go, that sounds an octave lower than your other one. And so you, you did a, a track playing regular violin and then a track doing the big clunky <laughs> violin uh, beneath it, the octave Geiger. Oh, that's so, yeah, I forgot all about that. Wait, we got to play, let's just play like 20 seconds of that, okay? Let's let people hear Minuet 2. You're going to hear me doing some pizzicato on Octave Geiger and also pizzicato on violin. Let's listen to this like short sample of that, okay? Here we go. Okay, so so David, um, I want to learn more about, you know, we're going to play a lot more music for everybody here. And so we're just giving people a taste real quick. We'll bring back some more music soon, um, especially I want them to hear Twinkle, because I think that in some ways is the biggest masterpiece. So after maybe we talk a little bit, maybe we can let them hear, because to me, that's just an amazing feat of composition on your part. But I like just to give people a little bit of a sense of like, how did you even come up with this idea? Why are you inspired to do it? I mean, I know that you're a composer. You went to Eastman. I think you got a master's from Eastman. You studied classical. You studied jazz. You're sort of an all-around incredible musician. You teach at University of uh, USC in Columbia now. You've done books on, you know, music business. You're kind of a Renaissance guy. But how specifically, was there something about your own relationship with your son that inspired this project? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was definitely, it definitely started with my son, Ashton, when he was four years old. And he started playing in a Suzuki program, was really excited about it and showed some promise. I think like your, both of your kids uh, right away. And he used to ask dad, will you play with me? And I mean, what could be better than making music with your kid? So I'd be performing along with him, you know, jamming along with him and just changing it up. You know, I would, I would play in different styles and different harmonies and just, trying to push his ear. One thing that was important to me from the beginning uh, was to never double the melody at the unison. I love the idea, actually, the, uh, Dr. Suzuki always talked about how music is like a language. Of course, when we speak a language, we don't always speak in unison with an adult. We find our own voice within the context of a conversation. So I was thinking about what does that mean musically and so we would just jam and i every time we play i mean I, I might play every piece that we did in 12 different styles and a lot of times different like polytonality all this crazy stuff it was finally time for ashton's first show <laughs> right it was one of those marathon events about 20 20 kids right. performing We're one talking. after the other and ashton was one of the youngest ones but I've always aspired to, even from that age, to teach him and anyone else who will listen, that music is about excellence, but not excellence alone. You should also find your own voice. So four-year-old Ashton came up to me and he said, you know, dad, I got it, I got it. What do you think about if instead of a normal pianist, you play with me, which <laughs> I'm just, I'm, okay, I guess I'm not a normal pianist, so there you go. Uh, he said, you, you, you can play with me, and you'll play your crazy music, but I'll play my part. And wouldn't it be cool if we both walked out on stage wearing shades? Yeah. It's like, 
That's a great idea. <laughs> this was the first show. I can't even tell you about the book one recital, right? <laughs> uh, where there was magic and jokes and all kinds of things. So, uh, so we went out on stage as was his wish and we performed. And we thought that the audience was gonna enjoy this because it was just like shaking it up a little bit. But we were totally unprepared for the response, which was like elation. We got this standing ovation for one of the youngest kids in the middle of a show that was otherwise pretty uh, polite. And it was at that moment that I realized there was a need, and certainly an opportunity to reimagine and kind of codify this music in a way that was relevant, uh, that was groovy, that featured creativity, uh, and would challenge students to think about music that they place so much already in a very, very different way. So much great stuff in the Supernova project, David. I am, in a way, in a way I got to say like this, I mean, I'm almost, I'll be 50 soon. And I started playing Suzuki violin when I was five years old. Hmm. And like just being involved in this project, I probably said it in the intro, but um, it's like a full, it feels like this, the, like my whole life has been living up to this moment to see this happen. And I just can't understate how important I think it is. I want to add to that, and I mean, just to clarify for anybody that's listening here, because hopefully some Suzuki teachers, Suzuki parents, private teachers, um, you know, this is something I've always done with with my kids as well, which is what I think what you're talking about is you're accompanying your kids as they're playing the tune, but you're just not using the book to accompany them. You're coming up with your own accompaniment, and because that's part of what you do, you're an arranger, you're a composer, improviser, you know, lots of styles. So you're like, oh, I could just, this is what I could play. I do that as well. I've done it with both of my kids, but I accompany on the violin. And so one of the things I work with a lot of my uh, adult students who are teachers is training them and, and is encouraging them. When you're teaching your private student, I encourage you to accompany your students because then they pick up on that. And, but also then you can be growing while you're playing with, with right. Your child. Like I'm sure for you, like you were having a blast because you were improvising with your son. So it wasn't just as passive, like just standing, supporting and cheering them on. It was like, you're like digging in the piano and having fun. And so this has been a huge, I think it's such a big point that teachers can engage more with their students but they could be learning while they're doing it. They can be having more fun accompanying and not just using like the duets that are written. So one of the things I love about this project is it sort of, you're really giving people permission. You're showing kind of a way to do this in sort of a world-class way, you know, but it's like, anybody can do this. Like you can play behind Twinkle Twinkle, you know, if they're playing the melody, you know, you know, you could play, you could be dun, dun, dee. You can, t you know, with a violin, you can make a perfect a folk accompaniment like that. There's so many different ways. When you're playing, I'm just like, I just want to jam. Let's make music. But of course, there's the lag via Zoom. So we, alas, we can't <laughs> do that right now. Uh, but I, I love what you're saying. I think it's so valuable. And I would, I would go even a step further. Sometimes I think of it as a company. But a lot of times I approach it, it's like chamber music. And it's okay for where we're more equal partners. And, you know, I bring my experience as an old, old man, and he brought his experience as a brilliant four-year-old. Uh, and we both had moments to shine. And there, there might be times where he was accompanying and I was playing something on top. And then I would be accompanying and, and he would be playing the melody. So it was really, you know, give, give and take. We were all important collaborators. Yeah, well, a lot of people in uh, the classical music uh, teaching world have been talk using this buzzword for the last couple of years of saying, how can we incorporate a quote unquote jamming culture uh -huh. into yeah. our school, into our studio? Uh, let's talk about jamming culture, because there's a lot of classical um, teachers who have, you know, been more, um, they've, they've awoken to many reasons why going beyond, let's say, traditional classical teaching is important. And there are many reasons. There's, you know, cultural relevance, for example, this idea that that music from all over the world is learned in many different ways and and uh, has uh, and, and, and that we don't want to be um, we don't want to be too narrow in our Eurocentric approach to music, for example. 
this is, I think, a very important reason for many people right now. Um, and and there's also um, what do they call SEL? You know, this awareness that 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 students learn in different ways, and that students have different strengths that they bring, and that we want to be able to highlight and speak to these different strengths. And you know, Suzuki teachers, as diverse a community as it is, and as many disagreements as there are, I believe that for the most part, these are teachers who love their their students. You know, they're coming oh, from a place of love. So student centric. Yeah, and, and so no matter what you want to say, is Suzuki this, is Suzuki that, to me, it comes down to that all these teachers come from a, a real deep place of love. But and what I love what I love about this collection, I think everything that I did and everything that you did, this is just building on a premise that's already there. This is not right. challenging anything. We're doing uh, we're very much the, the, so many of these ideas about using the same material to develop new skills. That's something that Suzuki, Dr. Suzuki brought into the world, and we're building upon that premise. Absolutely. I love that. And I think that's a perfect, that ties in with jamming culture, because it's like for, here's one of the questions that, that I had uh, an adult. This is a, a woman who has been running a, a music school, successful music school for maybe 20 years. And she said, you know, how can we bring jamming culture into what we do, albeit that we still want to be primarily a classical traditional institution, <laughs> which is like, you know, it's like, wait a second, what, what, you know, why even frame it that way? But what would you say to someone like that? Because obviously what you're saying is like, yeah, we respect this repertoire. We respect the skills, you know, right hand technique, left hand technique, rhythm, intonation, all the things that are musicianship. So what is antagonistic to that about jamming culture? You know, like, what would you say about that? Well, I, I, first of all, I want to say on a bigger level, you know, we're recording this. We're both in our basements, A, because we live in different places, and B, because we're distancing from everyone, right, in this crazy world. And at a time where a lot of schools are closing down uh, and, you know, not having students there, and a lot of educators, they're not able to do their group classes and the likes, I've heard from a lot of people, this is the time we need to be really advocating for our programs. Because a lot of school administrators, for example, say, why do we need to have music programs if you can't even play together? And of course, advocacy is important, but I would argue this is a time also, and maybe more importantly, to be visioning or revisioning and figuring out why are we here in the first place? What are the primary goals? And look, there's a big world out there and there's room for many, many types of music education programs with different kinds of emphases. Uh, but it is important to think, what well, is the most important thing we do? Is it a style that we teach? Is it, is it classical music? Is the most important thing we do an instrument that we teach? Is it composers that are no longer are with us, but that we love so much that we teach? Or do we teach students? Yeah. And then if we teach students, figure out, well, what is it that students need? One argument for this idea of jamming culture, you know, that I see so much of the time is in many communities, there's no problem. Uh, there are a lot of people that want to start playing string instruments when they're four years old, five years old, six years old. The problem is middle school. Mm -hmm. And then what happens when they get to middle school is those folks that are at the top of their game continue on, they thrive, maybe they go and get a PhD in music. Right. And anyone else often or many other people drop out because they say, well, I, this isn't this isn't my thing. And uh, I'm going to do something that's more fun. So the first thing that comes to mind, just jam the notion of jamming and you can jam over Beethoven or jam over Coltrane. But the idea of jamming is just it's a fun idea about making music. There's there, there are things we can look at in terms of both product and process. I mean, definitely the way that uh, a jazz groove or a, a, a rock and roll groove fee or a flamenco groove sounds very different than classical music, but it's also approached in a different way. And that's fascinating. So for example, a lot of jazz musicians, when they learn, they learn by listening to a recording and they transcribe what they hear. And a lot of classical musicians are glued to a sheet of music and they have to see the note and they can't ever play it by hearing it only by looking at it. Now Suzuki teachers do more ear work than a lot of other classical training and I, and I love that element of it. But those things don't necessarily have to be related that way. You could take a lot of the principles from one kind of music and apply it somewhere else and you know vice versa. Yeah, 
I love that. I, one of the things that you said that I think is a thousand percent Suzuki, and which is that we don't teach kids to be great violinists. Uh, we, when I say we, I mean Suzuki teachers, parents, because it's a triangle, right? It's the it's the it's the Suzuki right. teacher, the parents, and the kids. You know, in Suzuki, and I and I'm not Suzuki certified, but I am a very serious teacher and a student of teaching, and a dad, and a Suzuki grad. So I feel like I have my own perspective on this. And um, I've heard so many great Suzuki teachers tell me, we're not teaching kids to become great violinists. We're teaching them to be human beings, good human beings. And, and I have a version of this that I've been using with a lot of my adult students, because I think adult learners, it, you have a different type of relationship in some ways with adult learners, uh, because adult learners, and, and, free, and frankly, for teacher training, which is a lot of what I'm doing is working with teachers, because they're not seven years old, so they're able to have a more of an awareness and a kind of participation in the, in the conversation, I feel, with the teacher. Um, but what I say is that, like, I'm not, I'm not necessarily teaching you to, to learn everything in music and be every, you know, just be good. I'm, I'm teaching you to be a better friend to yourself. Hmm. And so even for adults, even for us, as we're being parents, as we're in a marriage, as we're running a business, as we're trying to become better teachers, you know, it, it, they're just vehicles for the resistance that we have, you know, for the fears that we have, the insecurities that we have, um, the, you know, the trauma we might have, you know, all these things and, and trying to become closer to our potential and so and but this is a thousand percent suzuki so i i agree with you so much on that point and and so whether it's i guess the point is whether or not it's jazz whether or not it's jamming culture whether it's classical off the page where you know it's about these principles and that's why i know dr suzuki would have been a thousand percent on board with this project but um we can come back to this i really want to let people hear twinkle um, I don't know if you'd be willing to share anything about this remarkable arrangement. I'd love to be able to play like a couple minutes of it so people can can hear it. Would you be willing to share anything about sure. Twinkle? So for most of most of these uh, verses in the collection, we have a melody track which has just the tune uh, played by violin, played by Rebecca, and then we have just the improv track which features you on top of our rhythm section. But in this one, we did something really unique and we put the two of you together. So you have that melody and then you were playing all around it. You know, what's interesting about this one, this is the very first tune in the collection, right? The very first thing that students learn. And even Rebecca's part is probably the hardest technically to play, even though she's not changing a single note, she's not changing a single rhythm yet some of the choices that she's made and the way that it fits together, this is kind of the most virtuosic one in a way. And of course, uh, when composing it, the challenge was, I mean, there are just these different rhythms. And of course it could have been any of a thousand rhythms, but I wanted to stay true to the original. I picked those. So the question is how, a lot of times in the, in the original, you get to the end of that rhythm and then it just plays the next rhythm. But when you're writing a through composed piece, how do you make music that really suggests going to this next place in the story. So this was um, really fun to work on, to, you know, to compose it and then to work with Rebecca on it and then bringing you in. It was, it was so was just magical. And with that, let's listen to Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, the phenomenal arrangement by David Cutler.
If you are a music educator and you're teaching online right now, I just want to make sure you're aware of some of the resources that we are providing at Creative Strings. Feel free to reach out to me at chris at christianhouse.com if you would like help, if you feel overwhelmed with teaching online. We've got so many free resources, including our play along lessons that you can use for your students and also other done for you, ready-made curriculum to help support you with teaching online. I firmly believe that teaching online can be easy and effective. So feel free to reach out to me and let me know if you would like my support with that. I would love to help. I want to plant a quick seed with everybody here that David Cutler, C-U-T-L-E-R, uh, he has launched a Kickstarter for the Supernova. And it's not only just for these recordings, but the sheet music, transcriptions, e-courses. It's a total game changer for the Suzuki world. And I just want you to go and look on Kickstarter. Just look for David Cutler, Supernova. And we're going to be putting links everywhere so you can find them. Uh, but I just want to plant that seed. Okay, so David, um, this project, it's been years in the making. Uh, again, for me, I mean, it's one of the most, uh, it's a project that I, my involvement in, I would say, was I, I took a lot of care in it, more than you would have ever expected <laughs> for a, a jazz violinist to spend on, you know, Suzuki Book One. But it was really meaningful to me, and it was a huge challenge. Um, but I think it's been really cool how you have developed this project to go beyond the original tension, intention, which was you being inspired to uh, arrange different, you know, uh, grooves to accompany your son playing Go Tell Aunt Rody and other book one tunes. And so now the project includes e-courses. It includes transcriptions. It includes uh, all these different recordings. Um, string ensemble arrangements. Yeah, string. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, string ensemble arrangements. So actually, Suzuki um, programs they can buy these arrangements that you've done for the ensemble. I mean, this is awesome. I mean, tell us about that. Tell us about the ensemble arrangements. Yeah. So the ensemble. I'm very excited about this. So you know, this project is just one that has grown and grown and grown, just like our young children who start to play music, right? So that, I mean, that's the whole idea is. How do you turn a twinkling little star into a supernova that makes a significant impact on the universe? That's the idea behind the name. Yeah. Uh, the string ensemble arrangements are written uh, there. So in addition to the melody statement from book one and the, the rhythm section recordings or a pianist, a live pianist could play them. Uh, in addition to that, I've added two or three additional violin parts to 10 of these. The third one, there's also a viola version. And then if you're working with a full string section, there's an optional cello and an optional bass part. So you could do it with a string orchestra or you could do it with a violin ensemble. So it's very flexible. They're, they're trickier. Uh, they're geared towards book four and higher students. So they, they use a lot more sophisticated rhythms that are built in um, and the likes. Not necessarily in terms of going into very, very high positions, but just using different kinds of rhythms. And we talk about that a lot. How do you get a rhythm to groove? That's one thing, by the way, that's so different between the classical world mm. and the jazz world, where, or in the popular world, right? In the classical world, we focus so much on the notes and the sound and the technique and all those beautiful things. In, in, in a lot of these other worlds, it's about the groove. It's about playing with a drummer. And that's tricky for a lot of uh, classical players to play, even if the rhythm is correct, to not rush, especially to rush. Sometimes there's dragging, it's usually rushing. Because in classical music, it's almost beautiful to always have this ebb and flow between the beats. But when you're playing with a drummer, you gotta play with a drummer, or you can play behind the beat or ahead of the beat, but, th but you want it to groove. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great skill. And so important. You know, that's what gets people to tap their toes, not all the cool notes, the groove. Well, and I always like to tag onto that point that, you know, that all these things on Dante's and uh, Waltz's and uh, uh, Gavotte's, these were all dance forms. So people danced to them, you know, back in the day, even if they're considered quote unquote art music. But I think a great one to play for people, since we we're just talking about your 
beautiful string ensemble arrangements, which again is just another thing that teach. What I love about this project is that, you know, everybody in the Suzuki world, parents, students, teachers, they're going to be able to do something new with this. They're, you know, with the same repertoire, the same principles of Dr. Suzuki, but with Supernova, they are going to be able, whether they get these string ensembles, whether they get the e-course, whether they use the transcriptions, they use the new piano accompaniments to just let the kids hear the music, it's going to reinvigorate people. It's going to give them new skills, motivate them, give them just a whole new view on everything. But I want to let them hear uh, Etude. And the reason why I think it would be appropriate, uh, I don't know if this particular one is one of the ensembles that they can get, but this is one that on the recording you used uh, a string orchestra ensemble to go with the band and with my performance. Would that be okay if we play a little bit of that? Is there anything you'd want to say? Absolutely. About? And I love how when you approached this one, you it was it was not just a free improvisation over the chords. It was really an embellishment. It was a, like a variation of of the melody. So you'll be able to hear the tune throughout it, but in a in a Chris House way. Awesome. Let's listen to. Uh, David's uh, full ensemble arrangement of Etude. I already told you that I feel like one of the biggest resources that is out there for us as string players right now having to do with technology is Electric Violin Shop. And I mentioned that the reason I think they're so great is because you can just call them on the phone. Well, you can find their number at their website, electricviolinshop.com, but I'm also just going to give you their phone number, which is 866 900 8400. Again, 866 866- 900 8400 so whatever that little thing that's been getting in your way of doing those loops or figuring out that electric instrument thing or whatever it might be just call electric violin shop you don't have to buy anything just get to know them they're great people they're down here in north carolina and they are a um, employee cooperatively owned business really awesome resource thanks to electric violin shop for supporting creative strings podcast Okay, David, that, that's beautiful. I, I just got to say, man, I love your writing, your arranging and your composition and the, the bread. You. I the love bread. your playing. I mean, I knew you were a great improviser, but coming to, I was like, oh yeah, Suzuki book one, two, so it'd be no problem. I got to say, I mean, improvising over 17 styles of music is no easy task. And <laughs> there's not, there's not a weak link in here, Chris. I don't know how, how, how you did that, but it was it was interesting because some of the pieces that I thought were going to be so hard and take forever to get, you just like nailed it. And then some of the other ones, they really, they took a while to grow and to find their own voice. But all of them had that wound up. I'm just so proud of, or joyous about everything that you put forward. Oh, thank you, man. Thank you. Um, I, w- I want to talk, I want to make sure that we get to talk about the e-courses because there's four components of the e-course, but before we do, and before we play much more of this music, hopefully, I want to ask your uh, question, uh, or kind of, I'm going to kind of frame my understanding of something and see how, your take on it, because it may be different. We, I mean, we have different kinds of education, you know, but in some ways we're very similar, because I think we're both very eclectic, and we like a lot of different stuff. We, you know, we both have kind of range, you know, but um, uh, um, here's what I want to ask you about, though. I think that the way I conceive of music education as existing right now, I see it as being sort of in 
that we could segment it in three general ways. And one would be classical music education, which in part uh, encompasses Suzuki, the Suzuki community, which is just one community within classical education. Uh, then jazz studies, which is its own, let's say, loose-knit community. I mean, all of these have diversity within them. And then I guess the way I've heard people describe it is the participatory culture, which which actually encompasses so many different participatory cultures, whether you're talking about rock bands, whether you're talking about African-American church music community, whether you're talking about um, uh, maybe mariachi bands who come from Mexico or tango music, you know, where there's this, you know, but, but that's how I've heard it described as participatory culture. And there was a, there was a scholarly piece I read a couple years ago that was talking about the the convergence of media and the participatory culture and i feel like this has been something that people have been grappling with and that it's only accelerating now with this heightened awareness of colonialism in music education and um and so there's more of a conscientiousness among classical music musicians i would argue that they're saying wait a second you know our approach is Eurocentric. It is marginalizing other approaches to music. Should we consider being a broader tent? Should we consider, you know, um, and and my thoughts are basically that jazz studies is similarly limited in some ways. Classical classical music is is limited in some ways, and I guess people could argue that any participatory culture, uh, to cultural approach to music might have its own limits too this kind of idea, general idea I've had is that we should be kind of taking the best of all of these and that music education should really be uh, a mixture of all these things rather than you study classical music. Now you addressed it briefly earlier, but what do you, what is your take on any of that? I'm just curious. Yeah, I, amen. Look, innovation, and I, I, I'm a creative problem solver and an innovator probably above everything else. Innovation is not usually about reinventing the wheel. It's about taking a lesson from one place and applying it somewhere else. But one of the challenges for so many of us is that we tend to spend our days with people who look and think a lot like we do. And I think so part of this awakening is we realize, oh, there are other great people and other great traditions that are out there. Even within music, and of course I go much further than just music education, I know you do too. But even within music, what if we, we have so many answers in there that we could just get out of our silo? And they're even, you know, they're the string silos and the, the different ideals between brass music versus string music. I mean, it's just a different instrument. Who, you know, as a composer, it's just like a different color, but there's these different traditions around, you know, who memorizes when? Like if you play classical guitar, you memorize your pieces, but if you play like piano, you, you do in this setting, but not, I mean, who makes these rules? So what I love about the, you know, that the, having the three buckets that you're just talking about is interesting. You could take one element, like if we look at process and product, you could take one element that you're comfortable with in your bucket and apply it and then take something from the others. So for example, you could take a classical music process of having all the notes and rhythms and trying to recreate something, but doing it in a very different style of music. Right, to say, okay, now I'm going to do this with salsa, but I'm going to take something that's heavily notated. I want to play it exactly the way that some great Cuban artist did originally. Or you could do something different. You could say, I want to take classical music, the same exact music that I've always played, but I want to approach it in a very different way and maybe draw a lesson from how jazz musicians uh, would learn something or would perform something. Something I think that's so interesting, I, I love looking at two different worlds and looking at the terminology that they use to see how similar it is. So for example, in classical music, we have this term standard repertoire, mm. right? Is this music that a lot of people play by Beethoven and Bach and Brahms. And the, and the goal is authentic performance practice. But we use the same term in jazz, right? We play standards. Right. But what's so interesting about a standard, same exact word, same concept, but for a jazz musician, your job is to play that piece that's been played 10,000 times before in a way that nobody else has. If you sound like someone else, you failed, right? That's not it. Whereas 
in the classical world, if you don't sound the way it was intended, you have failed. And it's interesting to think about, well, what if you take that value and apply it over here? And it goes both directions. It truly, it truly does. Classical music tradition does so many things better than any other on the world. And we should celebrate that. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I want to talk. Yeah. And again, I mean, what I love about Supernova is that you've, you know, you've used your creativity as an arranger, a composer, an improviser, a pianist, a classical musician, a jazz musician, someone who studied, you know, 17 styles or more. And, but it's not just an expression of your artistry, which is marvelous, but I, I really, why I like that we're doing this interview is because I feel like we're trying to connect lessons to the teachers, to the students, things that they can do to answer these questions that they've been wrestling with. How can we have more jamming culture? How can we be more in touch, go beyond our bubble of classical music? How can we inspire students to improvise? How can we help our students have a more sustainable relationship with their instrument, with music? How can we help our students connect with other communities of musicians? How can we help our students to know that they have something special to say as an artist even if they don't play as fast as the concertmaster in the orchestra right. you know, these are the dilemmas that we've all struggled with i think uh in music education in the classical world so the fact that this the ensembles that you're giving people the recordings but also the e-course which i want to come back to i want to really talk about this e-course because i think people are going to be <laughs> well you know part of it I, I i contributed a big part of it so of course you know i'm going to say that but Let's come back to that first. I want to do, I want to let people hear um, an example of Rebecca playing over your uh, arrangement of Minuet 3, and then immediately after that, play a little bit of my version over Minuet 3. As far as I remember, you set this to a jazz waltz. So like you sort a, of- Like a Bill Evans kind of sound. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Not, not just any jazz waltz, but like a Bill Evans, yeah, inflected. And, and this, was, yeah. this was, this was the- the most jazz, you know, I mean, I, you know, we use these big terms, but this was the most kind of traditional jazz kind of tune in the collection. Yeah, it has a very swing feel to it. And uh, I'd love for people to just be able to, to hear uh, Rebecca playing the straight melody. We'll do part of that. And then we'll put the same track up with me doing that, I guess, jazz <laughs> interpretation. So let's listen to uh, these two contrasting versions of Minuet 3. let you know about a wonderful free resource and it's on Facebook. It's a Facebook group and it's called Yamaha Music Educator Community. My friends at Yamaha post a lot of resources there. You can ask questions and they are really a great resource for all music educators and musicians. So check it out on Facebook, Yamaha Music Educator Community. And of course, if you're on Facebook, you might as well also join our free group which is Creative String Players. Okay, so David, let's talk about this e-course because I feel like, you know, again, the project, it has so many lessons if people just listen for the lessons and hopefully we're talking about those lessons in this interview. But the e-course is really going to be a place where they can get more literal instructions, <laughs> you know, things you can do. So the, so the e-course has four courses in one yeah, we're actually like calling it an e-school 
right? Yeah, it's okay. an e-school that has four distinct courses, each with a beginning, middle, and end. So would you like to talk about would you like to talk about the e-course and what you think teachers and or students might be able to take from it or parents? But I, I talk to a lot of teachers, I'm sure you do too, who, say, who feel like I really, I want it to be more fun. I want it to be more genre inclusive. I want it to be more creative, all these things. It just wasn't part of my background. And it's really difficult to teach something that, you know, that I never really learned. They don't even know where it feels so overwhelming to even start. And this will will hopefully get you not only to start, but to go far. So there are four courses in here. The first one is just on creative performance practice. So we take that approach that we mentioned before, right? Without changing a note or a rhythm, how can you make something your own? I give you all kinds of strategies for doing just that. Uh, technique by technique by technique, I uh, share some easy melodies that I wrote, eight bar melodies that are about the level of book one and show what is possible even without changing any of the notes or the rhythms on that. Uh, and for a lot of, we're just testing this out with folks now and the comments I'm getting are just like, this is for me because improvisation feels so far away from it, but I can wrap my head around changing the articulation, even though I never really felt that that was a right that I had before, and I'm excited to be able to uh, do that. You know, it's it's amazing. Even if you have eighth notes, right? Just like gavat, bop 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 bop. But by changing where you place the accent, you can get all kinds of cool grooves. So what if you just do the uh, you know the uppies, or bop 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 bop. Ba, ba, tika, tika, da, 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 right, and you can get all kinds of great, fun feels out of it, not changing anything else. And so in creative performance practice, we look at articulation, we look at color and ornamentation, and finally notes and <laughs> rhythms, but not making dramatic shifts, just you know, putting something up an octave or shifting it just a little bit. So that's the first course. The second course is about creativity puzzlers. There are 24 lessons, each five minutes or less, each one built around one creative challenge. Really the way this whole collection is organized is for a beginner, you're gonna learn a lot. And for someone who's a violin teacher, you're probably gonna learn a lot. And no matter what your level is, there's an entry point for you and you can apply it at, you know, with whatever you bring to the table because you're important to this conversation. I think that's something that's so important to both of us. It's not just the composer. I, I'm a composer, so I, I, I'm glad that we get so much good press. But as a performer, you bring great value. I remember when I was uh, 16 in, in high school, I was a sophomore. And, you know, since I had been playing since from the age of five uh, and I was in a small town, uh, so I, I was sort of like, you know, the concert master in the, in the high school orchestra and you know, I, it was like a lot of the stuff was kind of easy for me. Um, but I remember distinctly that there was this kid who was last chair, second violin. And when you looked at him playing the violin, you thought he could barely play his way out of a paper bag. Um, but that same kid would bring in these uh, recordings that he made at home. He had older brothers, so they had drum set, bass, you know, microphone. And he would write these songs where he'd be singing and banging on guitars and banging on basses. And he would bring these recordings in and all the kids would hover around him because they thought it was so cool that he was making his own stuff. And that was the first time that I had this distinct thought. I thought, I'm not like him. I'm not creative. I wasn't born a creative person. I'm, you know, call me a virtuoso if you want. I'm playing Paganini, but that's, but I wasn't satisfied. I was really disappointed. I really had this like harsh judgment about myself. And I swear to you, David, all the classical musicians, all the classical violin players that I have met and taught over the years, 99% of them have had that thought about themselves. Wow. And so I think it's so important what you're talking about because not only does the performer bring a lot to the equation when they're interpreting something, but they do, you know, just, they have a creative voice and it's like, there's a lot of ways they can get it out in music. But I just want to interrupt my own thought briefly. 
and so we can play a little bit of gossip gavot because uh you you did uh you did that great tango rendition and you were just talking about it a minute ago putting the accents on the different eighth notes and i think your arrangement is a perfect expression of that so can we listen to that real quick just a little bit of gothic gavot and i think if i remember correctly this has a little bit of a tango vibe so let's listen to uh david cutler's arrangement of gavot by gothic Awesome. So, um, well, I don't know, David, if you'd want to add anything to what I said before we listen to Gossip Gavad about, you know, this importance of recognizing, even if we are a classical musician, not only that our performance can be creative, but, um, you know, in the ways that you mentioned by making certain choices, but that we really have a creative voice, you know, and, and that we're, we're kind of cutting ourselves short. We're selling ourselves short because as classical musicians, we tend to have that limiting self-belief that, you know, I just wasn't born with the musically creative gene. Maybe I'm creative cooking. Maybe I'm creative with fashion, but it just isn't in me to play music. Did you ever have that thought? I mean, did, did you grow up playing classical or? or... You know, I, so I had the opposite experience of you. Because my main training growing up, well, it was the same as you in the sense that my main training was classical training, right? I played piano uh, from a very early age and studied with some great teachers. And my kind of my hero teacher, it was this Russian Jewish teacher who would work literally, we'd have two or three hour lessons every week, sometimes more than once a week. And he would just crucify me over every last little, you know, micromanaging every detail. And I'm so grateful for that training. But even when I was really young, I had to be creative. Like I just felt I couldn't, I couldn't limit myself to what was there. So I'd be practicing Mozart and just changing up a bit to make it better. <laughs> Whatever in my own mind, I'm sure it wasn't, but you know, in my own mind or to do something. And I got in a lot of trouble for doing that. Right, because I was within the classical church. So maybe you're the, the second violinist you're talking about was just making his own music, right? right but right. for me, I was in the classical music world. My mom's yelling at me saying, that's not what you're supposed to do. My teacher, and I, I so wanted to be his favorite. And I worked, I mean, practiced a lot, a lot, a lot. And I wanted to be one of his favorites. And he always said, why can't you be like my other students? Why do you have to goof, or, goof around? Why do you have to be such a clown? Can't you just do it the right way? Yeah. And so there was not, it was not only self-imposed it would like from me it was coming and i was told again i love this teacher he's one of my true heroes yeah. but it was something that was not permitted yeah. of course many years later they realized oh maybe there was was something to that and i think you know i wonder when you say well a lot of classical musicians feel i'm not creative uh, I wonder if that's because they just weren't given that opportunity. I wonder how different uh, for so many people their lives would be if part of their process was making personal decisions with consequences, not just accidentally discovering things, but deciding I want to do it this way and how that might be transferable to so many other areas of life, especially when we know we live in a world where it's changing at an exponential rate. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, you know, I, one of the points I make to a lot of kids that are playing music in different situations, schools I visit and all this kind of thing, is that in the arts, you know, there's not necessarily a winner of a race. You know, if you're if you're on track on the track team, then it's like somebody got first place, somebody got second place. But in the arts, like you can love, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder, and you can love Joni Mitchell, and you can love, you know, and it doesn't have to be a better. There doesn't have to be a winner. And it's the thing we love about artists is that they're unique and we, that they're different. And I remember um, sort of finally coming to that point of kind of 
after that disappointing thought about myself when I was 16 and maybe 20 years later, you know, finally kind of coming around to being like, you know what, I have my own voice and I'm really proud of that. And it's not better than anybody else's voice, but it's just something that I accept. And it's something that I feel proud of. And I know that it will resonate with someone. And I feel like for a lot of kids out there, that that's what I want to be able to convey to them. And so going into the, you know, my contributions on the e-course, you know, you know, I, I contributed two units, you contributed two units, they're both really full courses. So it's really four courses in one. But one of those is called anatomy of a groove. And it does break up that kind of creativity piece. And it gives teachers and students like really, really clear ways, again, to break down the creative process. Because just like you said, I, I totally agree. It's all about training. It's not about how were we born to be creative. I mean, there is an element of that. Maybe you were born more of a tinkerer, like you said, and I was more of a executor or whatever you want to call it, you know. But I think for all of us, we've got both sides of that in us, and, and we should we should uh, nurture all of that uh, as much as we can. So so my course called Anatomy of a Groove, it's like 16 short lessons that, uh, that helps, you know, give – the very explicit ways that you can work on creativity over a simple groove, over a simple vamp. And, and two the, chords, just two chords, the whole yeah. lesson, two oh. chords, and it goes in so many different directions. It's, it's amazing. Thank you. And then the other one, um, which I call Easy Tonal Improvisation, which is probably one of the most popular courses I've ever done. And I've redone it and redone it and added some new things that people haven't seen before for this one. Um, but the part of that that I think is going to be useful for violin players is empowering with knowledge, understanding harmony, understanding rhythm, understanding the role of the bass line, the inner voices, because as violin players or string players of any type, usually we're just so focused on melody. And so we grow our ears in Suzuki to a certain level, but usually it's just framed around melody. So we're missing all this context. You know, you, you you know, by the any Suzuki kid out here, any Suzuki teacher out here knows what I'm talking about. You know, your students, they're in book three, they're listening to book four, and they know book four by the time they get to it in terms of the melody. They've got great ears for recognizing classical melodies on their instrument, but they're not hearing anything else. They're not hearing what's the bass doing, what are the inner voices, they're not hearing the, the um, harmonic rhythm. They're, you know, and so what I have worked on really for more than 20 years is breaking this down in a way that string players can really, really simply figure out how to play. Um, well, really the technical definition would be understanding voice leading. Um, but really it's understanding what notes to play um, and how to, how to do that. Um, so, you know, I guess my kid told me that in schools nowadays, we learned that 70% of the human body is made of water. And I think that that was like a shocking revelation to me. And I think it was a similarly shocking revelation to realize that most of the composition of melodies and the improvisation of melodies, the way I'm going to put it is chord tones. Yeah. And, uh, and that might, you know, and, and it's like, once you can create a voice led uh, line of chord tones, you know, that's like the foundation of being able to do so many things. And as a pianist, that might just be so obvious to people like to David, who has been grown up with it, but it's, for violin players and cello players and viola players, it's absolutely counterintuitive. It makes no sense. It's this huge mystery. So this course that I've included in here, Easy Tonal Improvisation, is going to make it as simple as the most simple arithmetic problems for you to find the right notes, whether you want to improvise your own unique melody, whether you want to accompany, and that means teachers, if you want to accompany your students during lessons and jam with them and challenge yourself during lessons, whether you want to come up with a bass part, inner voices, whether you want to make your own YouTube covers, uh, whether you want to take a song and reimagine that song in a different style, like take something like, well, I use Paco Ball's Canon as one of the reference points, but then I take Paco Ball's Canon and I show you how to do it reggae, how to do it bossa nova, how to do it, and which is sort of, again, kind of what David did with, with Supernova, uh, you know, 17 styles for 17 tunes. So those are the four um, courses within the Supernova Creativity e-course. And I would say just yet another one of the amazing facets of the Supernova project. So let's let folks hear some more music. If it's okay with you, David, I would love to showcase Happy Farmer because it's just another one of your brilliant uh, creative demonstrations, you know, complete reimagining Happy 
Farmer. Got a lot of stride happening in here. I would like, again, like to contrast the version of, uh, maybe we'll go the other way. Let's do my uh, improvised performance uh, and or part of it. And then let's, sh right back to back, let's, let's hear the original melody by Rebecca Hunter. Wonderful performances that she does of the originals. Let's listen to that really quick. Happy Farmer. And I, re I remember going into recording this. This was when I was like, this one's probably going to be tricky because it's really fast. I think you did this in one take. <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't, I don't know about that, but. <laughs> okay, so we're going to listen to Happy Farmer. Okay, so we're back, David. Um, I want to make sure that uh, again that I that I stress to people that they need to go to Kickstarter, and um, or if later on if it's after the Kickstarter, then you know that they know how to find out about all these different components of Supernova. Um, and again, if I I might miss something here, but you're gonna get the sheet music, the transcriptions of violin solos. Which are the transcriptions of Chris's violin solos. Yeah, and then and also the piano accompaniments um, for anybody who can actually play them. And uh, the recordings, which a lot of which are probably going to be streaming on Spotify and that sort of thing too. But you can also get different kinds of recordings that you can download as well. Um, I think probably Music Minus One versions or something like that. Is that right, David? Exactly. Yeah, play alongs. And then the on string ensemble arrangements for your Suzuki studios um, that are, you know, really user friendly, I guess we should say, and also are going to engage your advanced students uh, who are getting into chamber music. And then this e-course, which is really four courses in one, I may have missed something, but the Kickstarter is really important. We really want you to get involved in the Kickstarter because I believe I do believe that this is like a once in a lifetime kind of game changing project. Uh, now I am a part of it, but even if I wasn't, I, this is, this is really important to me as someone connected with the Suzuki community. So I'm really calling everybody I know to uh, support this Kickstarter, go over there, check it out. You know, it's not just about giving money, but share it, you know, share some of these recordings, share this podcast. Um, and, just maybe tell us a little bit about the Kickstarter and what they can get from the Kickstarter, David. Well, the reason we're doing this part of it is this has been an amazing project. And I feel the same way. I've done lots of musical projects throughout my life that I'm, that I'm proud of. This one, I think, because of what it is and how it's framed, has potential to really, I think, make maybe the biggest impact on the education community, on the way that musicians approach their art form and the, and the likes. So, but it's been very expensive. So part of it has been a self-funded endeavor. Uh, so part of my goal here is to, to recoup some of the investment, but, but in a way that's always a win-win with you. So as is the case with many crowdfunding uh, projects is that you can make a pledge at a different level and then there is some kind of a reward. And essentially most of the rewards are actually you would get them, at, it's like a pre-sale at a discount. So you'll get them for even less than you'd be able to purchase them uh, down the road. And there are all kinds of things be, beyond the different products. Uh, there's one option where you could actually dedicate one of the 17 tunes to a loved one or to your program for all of time. So it will be printed in the print edition and it will be on our website. So everyone will know uh, long, long ago belongs to you. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of great things. And I think that the, one of the top things there is actually you could get a concert performance with the two of us. Yeah, it's great. Everybody you need to go to the Kickstarter, look for Supernova on Kickstarter. Uh, look for Supernova, David Cutler. Uh, go to David's website. Look, it's going to be, I'm going to be promoting on a, my website. Uh, reach out to David Cutler at his web. They can reach out. Is there a website they can reach out to you at, David? 
Yeah, just through SavvyMusician.com, S-A-V-V-Y Musician.com. We're actually reimagining that site. I don't know when it will be up, but that will be actually where the home for Supernova and a bunch of other projects is. Great. Perfect. Love that. But And I'm sure that if they just search David Cutler Supernova, they're going to be able to find it because uh, you're going to be everywhere. Uh, and hopefully everybody's going to hear about this. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to add, David, before we wrap up. I just want to say what a pleasure it is to, to chat with you now and especially to have gone on this crazy, crazy journey uh, through all of these different musical worlds. Um, it truly has been a pleasure. And so it's great to reconnect with you like this, Chris. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm going to play for them something on the way out. Um, maybe we'll listen to a little bit of Long, Long Ago uh, Ballad, uh, just another one of the 17 reimagined uh, Suzuki Book One pieces by brilliant arranger, composer, uh, music entrepreneur and educator, David Cutler. Thank you, David, for being here today with us on the Creative Strings Podcast. Thanks so much, Chris. Once more, if you'd like to learn more about this amazing project, Supernova by David Cutler, I highly recommend you check out the full project. There are so many aspects of it, sheet music, um, the, the audio components, the backing tracks, courses, everything and more at tinyurl.com forward slash supernova music. I hope you enjoyed this episode with David Cutler all about Supernova, and I hope you'll stay in touch. You can reach out to me anytime at chris at christianhouse.com. Please share these episodes. Uh, we take a lot of time so that we don't waste your time, and we try to make these uh, well-produced and enjoyable and inspiring. Um, just a couple reminders. First of all, thanks again to our sponsors, Yamaha and Electric Violin Shop. And if you would like support with teaching online if you would like to grow to become a more confident player um, and a more competent musician please reach out and go to christianhouse.com or just email me because we are offering our boot camps free resources creative strings academy and just always working to come up with more resources to support you whether you're a player or whether you're a teacher Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time.